call one two one two. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, brought to you by an all-British cast. Only the names have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Now this is the voice of the custodian of Scotland Yard's famous Black Museum, Chief Superintendent John Davidson. Good afternoon. This is a man's handkerchief. I doubt you've ever seen a handkerchief so stained with blood. I don't believe I have. I just like to touch it. They should really wash these things, shouldn't they? If the young man who owned it had washed it, he wouldn't be where he is now. No, I don't know exactly where he is, but I've been led to believe it's an unpleasant place. His body is buried, as Mr. Justice Coburn said, within the precincts of the prison in which he had been confined. That was Pentonville Prison, where a great many murderers are buried. Now, here is Chief Inspector Godfrey Allen Rouse, who had most to do with the case number H-42426. Yes, I'd been on duty all night. No, I'd had no adventures at all, except an interview with a sad, fat man who accidentally set his bed on fire and whose landlady was annoyed with him. I don't believe the poor man has smoked cigarettes in bed since. I was shambling sleepily along a certain street in the West End, thinking how nice it is to go to bed at the height of the full, fresh, fragrant morning when my arm was rudely seized. My thoughts of bed vanished with a minor popping sound as I recognized the features of Mr. Alistair Crumbine, proprietor and chief clerk of the nearby Forensia Hotel. I gather from Mr. Crumbine's gobbling that Someone was violently dead in his hotel. Sighed and followed him. There, a functionary conducted me by means of a frighteningly creaky lift to the top floor of the frenzy and preceded me into a room, the door to which was standing open. Across the neat bed lay the body of a dead woman, appallingly battered about the head and upraised arms. She was a thin, middle-aged woman and there was no sign of blood on her. She'd been carefully washed off. Although the bed linen was spattered freely... There was no sign of a weapon in the room, except for the carnage on the bed was quite tidy. A door leading to what I assume was a private veranda was closed, locked, I afterwards found, from the inside. The functionary and I stood and looked silently, and then I heard the lift creak again, and Mr. Alistair Crumbine was there. Who is she, I asked Mr. Crumbine. She's dead, isn't she? There's no doubt she's dead, is there? I reassured him, and he burst into lamentation. Oh, my poor hotel. What's my poor hotel going to do with people getting murdered in it? What's to happen to me? What happens to your guests, Crumbine? He is a guest, isn't he? Who is she? Oh, the poor lady in my hotel. She's dead. Yes, she's dead. Who is she? Eh? Who is she? It's Lady Madge Johnston. She's dead. I knew of Lady Johnston... Lady Madge Johnston, a well-known philanthropist, widow of Sir Lawrence Johnston, a former member of the London County Council, reputed to keep a large box of crisp one-pound notes for handing out to indigents at all times. What are you doing, Alistair? The box of money is here, all right. You mean there is a box of money? Look! You may believe it or not, but there was a great Schweppes ginger beer case still bound with iron straps under the bed, and it was... Absolutely running over with fresh, crisp Bank of England pound nerves. Who? Cool. Wonder if it's all there. Uh, wonder if he took a fistful. Who? Chap that did her in. I wonder who did it. In my hotel. When did it happen? The maid found her when she brought up a cup of tea at seven o'clock, like she always does. Darjeeling tea, she always drank the poor thing. Mm, nasty, strong stuff. At seven in the morning. Yeah. And then the maid came and woke me up and hurried, uh, hurried home at once. Had a seizure, she said. Elsie Weed from St. Louis, USA. Who? Uh, uh, the maid. I had a seizure. She say anything? 
Only that she was going home. She had... I know, I know. Seize him. Anybody else been here? I don't think so. No. Who was that man who brought me up here? He's been here. Oh, the fellow is the porter. He operates the lift. He here? Eh? Was he here? Oh. Uh, he must have been, mustn't he? Has he any ideas? What does he know? I'm afraid I didn't ask him. Get him. I want to talk to him. Uh, oh, oh, yes, of course. Get him. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. Fellows! I say fellows! Isn't there a bell on that lift? Oh, yes. Well, use it then. Oh, he, he, he'll hear me. Fellow! So will everyone else in the hotel. Oh, do you think so? They'll have everyone up at the place here, and I, I don't want them. Ring the bell. Uh, oh, yes, of course. He'll be here at once. Where does where does that door lead? What door? Oh, to the veranda. wonder if he got in that way. Uh, don't open the door. Oh, don't be careful. You'll fall. Be, be careful. What on earth oh. happened here? Oh, I should have told you. Oh, I hope you didn't fall. Uh, only you're still there. Uh, there's no floor on the veranda. What? We have the carpenters here, you know. They're making a few changes. Some new floors in the veranda. A new... A man could break his neck here. It is quite a fall, isn't it? Where are these carpenters? Have they got ladders? Ladders? Yes, of course they've got ladders. How do you think they get up here? Do you suppose it was a carpenter that did it? Oh, but they all go home at night. They leave the tools and... I say, she might have been struck by a hammer, mightn't she? Let's see. Might very well have been. What about their tools? I was saying, they leave them in a storeroom, locked down on the ground floor. We shall go down there and look presently. Best send for these carpenter chaps. Do you suppose... I say, do you suppose one of them could have done this? They do use hammers, don't they? We shall see. I think we should have them here at any rate. Oh, by all means, old boy. Oh, here's the lift. I'll tell Fellows to ring up the carpenter foreman and have him. Oh, uh, Fellows, would you... Oh, it isn't Fellows, is it? Oh, good morning, Cephalie. Uh, where's Fellows? Good morning, sir. He went home. His time was up. I'm on duty now, sir. I'm here. Oh. Oh, dear. Who is it? Cephalie, sir. I'm the day man. Fellows went home. Get him back here at once. Yes, sir. But I don't know where he lives, sir. In South End, I think, sir. Or Hammersmith. Or perhaps it's Shepherd Bush. I'm not sure, sir. Houston? Well, do you know where that carpenter foreman lives? Get him at once. Yes, sir. So I'm not sure... Here, here, here. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait a sec. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Simply isn't as bright as he might be. No, sir. But there's Lady Johnston. Morning, Lady Johnston. She said. Oh, what's the matter with Lady Johnston? Please go, Cephal. Run along, old boy, do. Yes, sir. Shall I, sir? Oh, is something wrong with Lady Johnston? She hurt. Is she? What shall I tell the boy? He'll find out sooner or later. She's dead, son. Oh. What's the matter with her? She's been killed. Who killed her? We don't know, Cephalie. Now, please go on. I know. I know. It's one of them carpenters has killed her. That's why you want me to go find them. I know what you're talking about. I know. I know. Be quiet, Cephalie. Huh? Well, who did then? Tell me who did. Tell me. Now, go on, Cephalie. Yes, Mum. <laughs> Sir. Poor Lady Johnston. I know. I heard him. I heard him talking in the night. Well. Well, indeed. Do you have many like that? Poor Syphilis. Still, the boy may be right, you know. About what? About the carpenters, of course. Why? Well, who said she was battered to death with a hammer? A hammer's a carpenter's tool, isn't it? A weapon? I said she might have been beaten with a hammer. She might have, I said. Well. Are there no other hammers in your hotel? The carpenters have the only one. They're the ones who did it. They must be. They did it. Now, wait till we get them here. Uh, don't you think so, Chief Inspector? I don't know. Well, then. Who could have? I don't know that either. You wait till we get them here. You'll see. Look here, old chap. Uh, eh? Just run along to a telephone, will you, and ring up Scotland Yard. It's Whitehall, 1212. 
Tell them there's been a killing here and ask them to send some people. Uh, send who? Uh, whom? They'll know whom to send. And tell them I'm here too, will you? And I want someone to relieve me. Yes, sir. Uh, what'll I do then, sir? Uh, then I suggest you go talk to Sipoli. Perhaps he and you can think up some good ideas together. I'm your man. Oh, poor Lady Johnston. Whilst Crumbine dashed down the stairs, which also creaked abominably, I sat myself down with Lady Johnston's corpse of things. These are the things I thought of. A, the good charitable lady had been killed in the night. Whoever did it uh, had, with the good lady, made a great deal of noise. No. Who heard the noise? And when? Did they recognize any voices? Someone who was familiar, or had uh, become familiar with arrangements at the Forensi Hotel did it. Else, how, how had he known about Lady Johnston? How had he got in the room? That door to the outside of the veranda had been locked. And the veranda five floors above the street is no floor anyway. How did the intruder get in? Or had he not had to get in? Had he been inside all the time? And what had the night porter been doing? Suddenly, I must have a little talk with that night porter, and I remembered his name, Fellows. The man who had been relieved by the boy Sipoli and gone home to South End or Hammersmith or Shepherd's Book or perhaps Houston. The night porter would have a lot of questions to answer, I could foresee. Lady Johnston said not a word to me, but grinned horribly. There were, there were a couple of spots on her face the person who had washed her up had missed. Excuse me, milady, I muttered, and went to look at the outer door. The key which had locked it was still in the lock where I had left it. The inside, mind you. I opened the door. The floorless veranda yawned above those five stories to the street. Could a, could a ladder, I wondered, carpenters use ladders? I must see if that foreman carpenter or his mates had been reached yet. I closed the door, <coughs> locked it. Went out and rang to the lift. After a moment, it started up. Well, I reflected that would at least save time. I could ask simply some of the questions that plagued me. Perhaps he might know something. I waited as patiently as I could. At last, it hove in sight. Hello, Sipoli, I said. I could see Sipoli staring up at me. Hello, Sipoli, I said. Why, you remembered my name, sir. Thank you, sir. Hardly anyone remembers my name, sir. Joseph Adoniram Sipoli, it is, sir. From Blackpool. Way up in Lancashire, sir. I don't know your name, sir, though. Well... Oh, no, don't tell me. I'll find out. Poor Lady Johnson, she didn't remember my name either. She always called me boy. I hate being called boy, don't you, sir? Yes, sir. Do you want to see Mr. Crumbine, sir? He's on telephone. He's calling the foreman carpenter, sir. Mr. Morris, like you said. Only he can't get Mr. Morris on the telephone. And so he called Fellows. Fellows is the night porter, sir. And he lives in Kennington. Not South End or Hathnet or Shepherd's Bush. Or Houston. No, Kennington. Mm -hmm. Kennington isn't far away and Fellows be right here. In a minute, and maybe you'll know who killed poor Lady Johnston. She was so nice. But she always called me boy instead of my right name, Joseph. I don't know him. Don't you feel dreadfully sorry about her? I'll take you to the cellar, sir, whilst Mr. Crumbine's on the telephone. This is the cellar, sir. There. Nothing down here. Storeroom, sir. Where we keep the guest trunks and boxes and everything, sir. Excuse me, sir. I beg your pardon, sir. Excuse me, sir. I'm always bothering the guests, sir. Mr. Crumbine tells me, and... Look here, Sibley. You're not bothering me, and besides, I'm not a guest. Minor. Well, sir, I want you to know that I'm really not such a simpleton that Mr. Crumbine thinks I am. Now, look here, Sibley. He thinks I'm not quite right, sir. But I'm right, all right. And I have the equivalent of a high school education, sir. Oh, really? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I know algebra, sir, up to binomial theorem, sir. And I'd wager Mr. Crumbine doesn't know that much about algebra. And I know Latin. Quos quetanem abutere catilina patientia nostra. That means, how long, O oh, Catiline, are you going to continue to try our patience? And I know Kipling quite well. My father was a great student of Kipling. Excuse me, sir. There's a widow in Sleepy Chester who weeps for her only son. There's a grave on the Parbeng River, a grave that the Burmans shun. And there's Super da Prag Tivori to tell how the deed was done. That's the, uh, that's the grave of the hundred head. I know it all, but... 
Excuse me, sir, I forget so much. I think that's why Mr. Crumbine thinks I'm not quite right. I can't remember things. I tried for me trade test in the war, sir, but right in the middle of the examination, I forgot. I've forgotten what I forgot, but they made me go away. That's the room there where the carpenters keep their tools. Wouldn't you like to look at it, sir, while Mr. Crumbine's on the telephone? Well, goodbye, sir. I wonder if he heard anything last night. Or has the poor beggar forgotten it? Well, I suppose we'll never know. Poor kid. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Chief Inspector. How did you get down here? The lift. Oh. Uh, simply take you to the wrong place. I'm going to sack that, sir. Oh, no, 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 no. This is quite the right place. Did you get your people? The carpenters? No. But they'll be coming in. The fellows? Yes, he's on his way. Turns out he lives in Kennington. No distance at all. What do you mean about the right place? You want something down here? I thought I'd have a look at this place where the carpenters store their tools. You do think it was a carpenter, did it? Where's this place? Just a step. Here. Not locked up. Well, they go in and out all day. Come on, I'll show you. Here they are. The carpenters? No, old chap. The tools. Let's have a look. Saws. Whatever these things are. Planes. Levels, drill braces. Mitre boxes. Hammers. I say, let's have a look at these. Suspicious, eh? Suspicious, eh? Yes. Well, let's have a look. Looks all right. So it's this one. There's only three. Three what? Hammers. Uh, hammers. Matter. This one's clean. Beautiful. These carpenter chairs. I mean it's clean. Oh. You mean like the old lady was. Carpenters don't usually wash their hammers, do they? Well, I don't know. I'll tell you, they don't. Look at the others. See? Sawdust. Rust here. Paint. I see, but... I know. Maybe it's new. I don't know. But I don't think so. Well, have you found the murder weapon, gentlemen? Whitehall 1212, to which you are listening, is compiled from records of authentic cases from Scotland Yard. The research is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. In today's story, Chief Inspector Rouse has just discovered what may be the murder weapon in a cellar storeroom. Now, back to the story itself. The people from Scotland Yard for whom I had asked, photographers, fingerprint men, all the rest, including a relief for me, had now arrived, and I sent an earnest young constable back to the yard with the extraordinarily clean hammer with instructions to take it to the forensic laboratory people for a thorough examination. I sat down in the corner of the cellar with Alistair Crombine and Fellows, the night porter, and held grave discussion. Good thing you got me before I got into bed, sir. Why is that, Fellows? Uh, once I got my eyes shut, sir, you'd never have woken me up till Monday, sir. Oh, heaven. Is today Sunday? As ever was, sir. We all ought to be in church singing hymns or praying or going on like they do, sir. As I say, sir, it's a good thing you found me sitting there eating the last of my liver and onions and my Sunday night shirt, or I should never have waked up until 8 o'clock Tuesday night and Monday being my night off, sir. At which time you'd have been sacked, because you're due on the job at half past six, my dear fellows. I'm sorry, sir. That's why we weren't able to reach those carpenters. And all at non-conformist chapel, sir. Well, you can arrest them Monday, Chief Inspector. Why should I arrest them? Well, it was their hammer that Lady Johnston was murdered with, wasn't it? We don't know that yet, you know. Wait till I hear from the report. That's to be certain you know, sir. You know what Sibley's been saying, sir? Oh, that nonsense. What's Sibley been saying? <laughs> if you listen to everything Sibley's been saying, what's Sibley been saying? He says he recognized them, sir. 
At least three or four times he told me, sir. What's Sipley been saying? Oh, a lot of nonsense. What, fellows? Well, sir, excuse me, Mr. Cumberland. He's been hearing voices. Voices? Voices? What kind of voices, fellows? Well, uh, may I tell him, sir, what Sipley's been saying? <laughs> if you want to make a fool of yourself. I believe him, sir. That lad wouldn't tell a lie. He hasn't brains enough to tell a lie. Well, what has he been saying about voices? He's been hearing him, sir, nearly every night for a week. What sort of voices, fellow? Sibylette. Let's have him in here and ask him. He's gone, sir. I, I met him when I came in. I sent him out for some coffee for all these Scotland Yard fellows. Oh, thank you, sir. We're all very grateful. Wonder where all my men are. All over the place. Well, sir... Sibley's been telling me uh, he sleeps here at night, sir, in the other end of the cellar. That three times, I think it is, he's been he's been waked up and by strange men and voices whispering. He's bummed. Now wait, sir. I thought I heard him myself. And Sibley and me have been well, we've gone hunting for him all over the hotel. <laughs> Final? Well, no, sir, but I believe they're the one that stole at Emma, if they did, and killed poor Lady Johnson with it. Sipley swears he's heard them. Unless it's a... What is it? A, an hallucination. Might be, you know. He's been waking me up every night, practically. You don't believe it. Well, clues sometimes come from the strangest places. Well, there might have been somebody planning to. Yeah. Still, we never found anybody. It'd be extraordinary if you did, fellow. Beg your pardon, sir? It isn't that simple. But, sir... But it's interesting enough to make me want to know more, I can assure you of you that. You so? <laughs> Nonsense. The men's dark. Well, we'll see. <laughs> and at that moment, the earnest young constable I'd sent to the laboratory with the two clean hammer arrived. Well, constable, I said? Yes, sir. They've examined it. There's a preliminary report, sir. I was being a little too Sherlock Holmes. No, sir. Eh? No, sir. Why? Well, should I be for these gentlemen, sir? Eh? Oh, come by. Well, it's your hotel, and fellows. Uh, perhaps we may find your whisperer. Zipper is, sir. Speak up, Constable. Well, sir, first the laboratory said the hammer looked too clean to be true. Ha. Huh. It was. It had been wiped clean. Exactly what I said. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, when they started to examine it under a low-power microscope, sir... What did they find? A drop of blood. A blood stain, sir. Well, well, well. Yes, sir. Under one of the claws, here, where the cleaning rag missed it. The type? A, B, sir. Under what type Lady Johnston's is? Well, we got a sample, sir. That's what took me so long. What type? They're identical, sir. This is the weapon she was killed with. Constable, uh, There's I... something else, sir. What's that, Constable. Well, uh, sir, will you gentlemen excuse me for a moment, please? Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. Well, Constable? I stopped by the CRO, sir. The criminal records office, hmm? Well, that's quite right. There should be a check made of every person concerned in every crime investigated, of course. I have some checks, sir. Good. Here. Both these people? Yes, sir. Let's see. You'd better turn your back to them, sir. Yes. Yeah. Combine and Alistair. No record. Well, I'm glad of that. Yes, sir. Read the other. Fellows George. No record. Well. The other one, sir. Sipoli, Joseph Adonirum. Oh, no. Read it, sir. I needn't need to more than glance at the card. Sipoli, Joseph Adonirum had been convicted twice. Once for robbery... Once for causing grievous bodily harm, both felonies. Who was not quite right? And when Sibley returned with the coffee for the Scotland Yard men, the earnest young constable and I called him aside. In Sibley's own room, we showed him the card containing the notation from the criminal records office. He looked at me with something of a sneer. And his voice wasn't the same. Well, cop, I suppose you want to search me. I turned away while the constable frisked him, as the Americans put it. Nobody said anything. When I turned back, the Sibley was grinning at me. The constable looked at me in horror. 
There on the little table before him lay a bloodstained handkerchief. It was in his pocket, sir. <laughs> Don't let that give you any ideas, Chief Inspector. I was boxing the day before yesterday with good old fellows, and he bloodied me nose. Ask him. Get him, Constable, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Fellows. Fellows! Come in here, please, Mr. Fellows. Right! Come in! Ask him. What's wanted, sir? Fellows, were you boxing with Sipoli here the day before yesterday? Yeah. Oh, yes, sir, I was. See? Did you give you a bloody nose, didn't I, sir? <laughs> and here's the handkerchief I sopped it up with. Uh, you've been carrying that wretched thing about in your pocket all this time. <laughs> But when we sent the blood-stained handkerchief to the laboratory, they found the blood on it was not type A, simply his own, but type AB, which was Lady Johnston's. Confronted with this anomaly, Sipoli made a statement. Yes, it's her blood. Yes, I killed her. I'm sorry I didn't get all of the blood off the armor. I made up the story of the people whispering. So if I couldn't blame it on the carpenters, there'd be somebody else. You'll find the handkerchief I used for my blue nose on floor of my room under the rug by my bed. <laughs> I just pocketed the wrong one. They both looked to lock. It's no good, I give up. I murdered the old... Fool. Why? I'll tell you why. Because everyone said I wasn't quite bright. Because nobody would bother to learn my name, Joseph Adoniram Sipoli. They called me boy. Just like the old lady did. Boy. So I killed her. I wish I could kill all of you. I didn't get any of the money, though. Phyllis came along too soon, looking for the people that whispered. So I went along with him. <laughs> we didn't find anybody. Boy. Boy, indeed. Not quite bright, indeed. Well, I almost got away with it, didn't I? Almost. Joseph Adoniram Fully was hanged at Penterville Prison and his body's buried in the precincts of the prison. The boy who was not quite bright. He wasn't a boy, though. He was 27 years old, so he looked much younger, as the prison surgeon who made the post-mortem examination said. Today on Whitehall 1212 was Horace Brayon as Inspector Rouse. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Morris Dallimore, Gordon Stern, Evan Thomas, and Lester Fletcher. This is Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.